The year 2005 in professional wrestling was like any other before and after, in that it was a year of frequent change. But the changes of the mid noughties were profoundly grand. It was a time of welcoming the new and respecting the old, of embracing the exciting future, or cozying up with the rich past, of enjoying fresh unions, of watching bitter disputes play out, of cheerful hellos, and of sad goodbyes. Perhaps more than any other year in professional wrestling history, 2005 was the densest amalgamation of yesterday and tomorrow, a dizzying mashup of vivid excess that made for a bewildering present. The three biggest American promotions all took unique steps forward in their personal growths, though the paths they walked weren't always of the primrose variety. The dawning of a generational spring, the rebelliousness of a punkish summer, the snug embrace of quaint autumn, and the reflective days of chilled winter. 2005 was packed to the gills with memories that spanned the spectrum. Those who experienced it can remember those halcyon days, and those who haven't will still find the stories familiar. Perhaps more than any other year, 2005 could sum up the whole of professional wrestling's history and philosophy in a nutshell. I'm Sam from Cultaholic Wrestling, and this is Timeline 2005. Join us. January 3rd. In the midst of a considerable push in TNA, decorated AAA star Hector Garza is arrested for steroid possession in Houston. Garza ends up being deported back to Mexico and is banned from re entering the United States for a reported five years, effectively ending his run with TNA. January 4th. New Japan's annual January 4th card, this one titled Tokon Festival Wrestling World 2005, is held before 46,000 fans at the Tokyo Dome. The 16 match card includes an eight man submissions only tournament won by former UFC and Pancrase competitor Ron Waterman, who submits Yuji Nagata in the finals. In the evening's main event, 24-year-old Shinsuke Nakamura defeats 28-year-old Hiroshi Tanahashi to win the short-lived Under-30 Openweight Championship, following a 25-minute battle. January 9th WWE holds its first ever New Year's Revolution pay-per-view before over 15,700 fans at Coliseo de Puerto Rico in San Juan. The six-match card proves disastrous when both Eugene and Lita sustain devastating knee injuries during the evening's first two bouts. In the night's main event, Triple H wins the vacated World Heavyweight title in an Elimination Chamber match, outlasting Randy Orton, Chris Jericho, Chris Benoit, Edge, and his own protege in Batista. Helmsley bulks at saving Batista from an Orton pin late in the match, which will be the big story going forward forward. January 16th. Final Resolution, the first of 12 pay-per-views TNA will hold in their Orlando Impact Zone home in 2005, makes for an above-average card. Top bouts include America's Most Wanted regaining the NWA World Tag Team titles from Bobby Roode and Eric Young, as well as AJ Styles capturing the X Division title in an Ultimate X match against Petey Williams and Chris Sabin. Some fan annoyance is registered at the show's ending, as NWA World Champion Jeff Jarrett retains his title against the increasingly popular, highly charismatic alpha male Monty Brown. On a card loaded with aging ex-WCW stars, Jarrett over Brown feels like a harsh reinforcement of the status quo. However, on the front of homegrown talents, Resident Monster Abyss shows up at final resolution, planting Jeff Hardy with the Black Hole Slam. This is actually a surprise, as Abyss's deal had expired and he'd been written out of TV as it was believed the monster was headed to WWE. Alas, Abyss chose to re-sign with TNA. January 18th. Pistol Pez Watley, a star in several Southeastern territories during the 70s and 80s, passes away from a heart attack days after his 54th birthday. During his career, Watley was known for his heated feud with former partner Jimmy Valiant, as well as reigning with the NWA Southern Heavyweight title on two occasions, and his occasional challenges of NWA World Champion Ric Flair. Late in his career, Watley was briefly an enhancement talent in Hulkamania-era WWF, and also served as a trainer at WCW's power plant. January 21st 
Raw brand star Batista makes some interesting comments during an interview with UK Rag The Sun about the performers over on SmackDown. Big Dave says in part, I try to watch the shows, but for me, they're hard to sit through. I've watched their tapings live and it seems like a lot of the guys couldn't care less. There's a lack of passion and pride. Ironically, Batista will end up on SmackDown later in the year, and the interview is reportedly part of the impetus for a fight Batista has with Booker T at a photo shoot over a year later. January 29th. The first ever Wrestle Reunion, a convention slash supercard rooted in warm memories, takes place in Tampa. The 14 match card is loaded with a staggering sum of stars past and present, from Roddy Piper, Dusty Rhodes and Terry Funk, to America's Most Wanted, Christopher Daniels and CM Punk. On the card, NWA World Champion Jeff Jarrett retains his belt over Tully Blanchard. January 30th. The 2005 Royal Rumble draws 12,000 fans to Fresno, California's Save Mart Center for what's an altogether excellent card. JBL and Triple H retain their world titles in the undercard, while Edge defeats Shawn Michaels mostly cleanly in the opener. These are all secondary to a slew of entertaining backstage skits, including an impromptu freestyle battle between John Cena and Christian. The star-studded rumble match comes down to earmarked future champions Cena and Batista. Disastrously, a botch sends both men over the top rope at the same time when Batista was supposed to hang onto the ropes. This brings out an irate Vince McMahon, who proceeds to blow out both quadriceps during and after his mad dash into the ring. Batista wins following an awkward reset, during which an immobilized Vince has to be helped away. February 4th. For the first time ever, an episode of Monday Night Raw emanates from Japan, as 16,700 fans file into the Saitama Super Arena for a TV taping. The following day, WWE tapes SmackDown in the same building before an even larger crowd of 18,800, and it's perhaps most memorable for WWE Champion JBL being accidentally tranquilized before cutting a promo on an inflatable lizard. February 6th. Amy Webber, a 2004 diva search runner-up that found a storyline position as a consultant in JBL's cabinet, resigns from WWE, reportedly due to bullying from veteran wrestlers. In a 2020 interview, Webber claims she quit following alleged altercations with Randy Orton and Edge on an international flight. February 11th. James Bell, former WWE Senior Vice President of Licensing and Merchandising, pleads guilty in US District Court to mail fraud. Bell admits that he arranged for WWE's licensing arm, SS and Associates Incorporated, to receive commissions that it was not entitled to. WWE also brings legal action against Bell for his perpetuation of the fraud. In 2007, Bell will be sentenced to eight months in prison and and three years probation. February 13th. TNA holds Against All Odds in Orlando, and it's a night of mostly good action. The highlight is X Division champion AJ Styles retaining against Christopher Daniels in overtime of a 30 minute Iron Man match. In the main event, Jeff Jarrett retains the NWA world title over Kevin Nash in a surprisingly good Smoke and Mirrors match, notable for Nash powerbombing Jarrett onto a cello. Sean Waltman makes his return to TNA during the match, while the former Billy Gunn, now named The Outlaw, debuts during the skirmish. February 16th. Satoshi Kojima captures the All Japan Triple Crown, ending the 529-day reign of Toshiaki Kawada in Tokyo. Four nights later, Kojima makes history when he wins the IWGP heavyweight title from Hiroyoshi Tenzan, also in Tokyo following an unusual stoppage finish. This makes Kojima the first man to hold both prestigious titles simultaneously, a feat since equaled only by Keiji Muto. February 20th. WWE's SmackDown brand holds no way out before 9,500 fans at Pittsburgh's Mellon Arena. In the main event, JBL retains the WWE title over Big Show in a barbed wire steel cage match, escaping the cage through a hole in the mat while an aloof Big Show glacially walks through the door at half the speed of biodegradation. 
In the undercard, John Cena defeats Kurt Angle in a tournament final to become number one contender to the WWE title. February 21st After many weeks of teasers, Batista finally turns on World Heavyweight Champion Triple H, swiftly undermining a plan by the Evolution leader to trick Batista into challenging JBL instead of himself at WrestleMania 21. The famed smiling thumbs up, bemused thumbs down moment leads to Batista beating up Helmsley and Ric Flair before signing the contract to face the game at WrestleMania. February 24th after photos of real-life girlfriend Lita are removed from his website, Matt Hardy posts an explanation to his message board, imploring fans to ask Lita why they were removed. It later comes out that Lita had been having an affair with Edge, and unfavorable crowd responses to both Lita and Edge going forward will reflect this revelation. February 25th After TNA ended its talent-sharing arrangement with Ring of Honor nearly a year earlier, AJ Styles wrestles his first first match for Ring of Honor since the previous March, losing to Jimmy Rave in Dayton, Ohio on night two of the company's third year anniversary celebration. March 3rd with Ohio Valley Wrestling already in place as a developmental wing, WWE begins setting up another farm system in Georgia, this one called Deep South Wrestling. On or around this date, a number of independent talents are signed for DSW, including the future Mike Knox and Mr. Kennedy. March 5th Kenta Kabashi's 735-day, two-plus-year reign as NOAA's GHC Heavyweight Champion, the longest reign in the title's decades-long history as of 2022, ends in Tokyo when Kabashi is defeated by one-time protege Takeshi Rikio. That same night, Ring of Honor holds an eight-team trios tournament in Philadelphia. In the finals, Homicide, Ricky Reyes, and Rocky Romero defeat Generation Next members Austin Aries, Jack Evans, and Roderick Strong. March 10th Spike TV, home of WWE Monday Night Raw and several secondary programs, announces it's pulled out of negotiations for contract renewal. As it stands, WWE programming will cease to air on Spike after September. March 13th A gimmick-heavy Destination X in Orlando features a bull rope match, a Falls Count Anywhere match, and a first blood match, as well as an Ultimate X match that Christopher Daniels wins to claim his first X Division title. In the main event, Jeff Jarrett, you guessed it, retains the NWA world title against Diamond Dallas Page after Monty Brown shockingly turns heel, hitting DDP with his trademark pounce. March 14th more than a decade after they last teamed up, Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty reunite as the Rockers for one night, defeating La Resistance on an episode of Raw in Atlanta. The match is a prelude to Jannetty facing Michaels' WrestleMania 21 opponent Kurt Angle on the following night's SmackDown tapings. The match with Angle ends up being a TV classic and briefly earns the 45-year-old ex-Rocker a new contract with WWE. March 15th at the SmackDown tapings in question, John Cena debuts a new theme song, The Time Is Now, performed by himself and his cousin, The Trademark. After more than two years of entering to basic thugonomics, Cena's new theme will persist through the remainder of his days as a full-time wrestler. March 18th WWE star Kurt Angle and NWA legend Danny Hodge are named two of the 15 greatest collegiate wrestlers of all time as part of the 75th NCAA tournament. Clarion University alum Angle was a two-time Division I heavyweight champion and 1996 Olympic freestyle gold medalist, while Hodge was a three-time NCAA champion at Oklahoma and an Olympic silver medalist as a middleweight. March 19th Developmental project Bobby Lashley wrestles his first WWE main roster match, defeating Spike Dudley at a house show in Knoxville, Tennessee. It'll still be another six months, however, before Lashley joins the SmackDown brand Brand on TV. March 20th. A SmackDown brand house show in Hattiesburg, Mississippi is compromised by severe weather, as a scant 1,500 fans attend, while only eight wrestlers and one manager show up for the event. JBL, John Cena, Booker T, Eddie Guerrero, Kurt Angle, Big
Big Show and all three members of Eminem. A seven match card is cobbled together, with most of the wrestlers working multiple bouts, including a staggering four matches for Cena and three for Show. April 2nd. Hulk Hogan headlines a WWE Hall of Fame class that includes six of his biggest enemies, including Rowdy Roddy Piper, Cowboy Bob Orton, Paul Orndorff, Jimmy Hart, Nikolai Volkov, and the Iron Sheik. After being inducted by Sylvester Stallone, Hogan has to wait for many minutes of raucous applause to die down before he can even begin his speech. April 3rd. WrestleMania 21 becomes WWE's new all-time pay-per-view king with 1,085,000 buys. Over 20,000 fans fill LA's Staples Center to see WrestleMania go Hollywood, a point driven home by weeks of faux movie trailers and an elaborate event set complete with marquee and red carpet. The big winners of the night are John Cena and Batista, who defeat WWE Champion JBL and World Heavyweight Champion Triple H respectively effectively to capture the first world titles of their careers. Though the matches aren't especially great, the veritable changing of the guard is nonetheless historic. The best matches of the night see Kurt Angle defeat Shawn Michaels in an instant classic and Edge win the first ever Money in the Bank ladder match, a stunt show that rivals the greatness of the best TLCs. Factor in moments involving legends like Undertaker's defense of the streak against Randy Orton, Steve Austin and Roddy Piper's confrontation, and a wildly received Hulk Hogan appearance, and WrestleMania 21, certainly one for the ages. April 4th. WWE announces that it signed a three-year deal with NBC Universal to return to the USA Network, which will pick up Raw after the contract with Spike ends that autumn. The deal also includes two yearly TV specials. April 5th. The Ultimate Warrior creates a stir during a speaking engagement at the University of Connecticut. In the midst of his remarks, Warrior spoke negatively about homosexuality and at one point tells the crowd, queering doesn't make the world work. Police are called in to quell what is said to be a near riotous scene, but Warrior is eventually allowed to finish his speech. The Young Republicans group that booked Warrior condemn his comments and apologize for booking him. April 11th. Both Matt Hardy and Rhino are released from WWE. Rhino's release is reportedly due to a scene he made at the WrestleMania after party the prior week, but Hardy's is in direct relation to him revealing Lita's secret affair with Edge, as the company cites unprofessional conduct on his part. Fans generally react with outrage at WWE for punishing who they believe is the innocent party in this situation. April 12th. Multi-time women's champion Molly Holly requests and receives her WWE release, later citing burnout and a desire to spend time with her family. That same night, John Cena debuts the spinner version of the WWE Championship at the SmackDown tapings in Chicago. Though the design is custom custom made for Cena's character, it will remain the official WWE title belt for the next eight years, regardless of its holder, though the spinning function is later phased out. The same taping includes the main roster debut of Eminem, consisting of indie vet Joey Mercury, Tough Enough winner Johnny Nitro, and Valet Molina. They'll win SmackDown's tag titles just a week later from Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio. April 17th. After 37 years of existence, All Japan Women shuts down after holding one final card at Tokyo's Corican Hall. In the main event, Kumiko Maikawa and Tomoko Watanabe defeat Amazing Kong and Saki Maimura. April 18th. A double taping of Raw and SmackDown is held at Madison Square Garden and is notable for two reasons. One is Triple H losing an 11-minute no-DQ match to Jim Ross, yes, that Jim Ross, after Batista interferes. The other is the fact that this is the last WWE card at MSG for nearly a year and a half due to disputes over increased costs to rent the famed building for TV. April 20th. Kensuke Sasaki wins the 2005 All Japan Champion Carnival, defeating Jamal, the future Umaga, in the finals. Sasaki joins Keiji Muto as the second man to have won both a Champion Carnival and a G1 Climax in their career. 
The same day, former X Division and NWA Tag Team Champion Kid Cash receives his release from TNA. Cash had been openly critical of TNA's booking, and the fact that he had apparently not been offered a pay rise in his three years with the company. Also the same day, WWE releases WrestleMania 21 for the Xbox. Though the game is a visual improvement from its predecessors and includes a new reversal system, poor gameplay and numerous glitches are cited as detriments by fans and critics alike. April 24th TNA holds its first ever lockdown pay-per-view in Orlando, a night in which every match takes place inside of a steel cage, or six sides of steel due to the particular ring shape. This includes a three-on-three take on war games called Lethal Lockdown, which is won by DDP, Sean Waltman, and BG James, the former Road Dog. In the main event, AJ Styles defeats Abyss in a brutal encounter to become number one contender to the NWA world title. April 28th. Four days after suffering a fractured tibia and fibula, as well as a dislocated ankle at lockdown, Chris Candido passes away from pneumonia at the age of 33. Prior to his death, an injured Candido appeared at the post-lockdown Impact tapings, where he managed the Naturals to the NWA World Tag Team titles. These appearances were aired on TV after Candido's passing. During a long career that began at age 14, Candido held gold in WWE, WWE, WCW, ECW, and Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Candido's biggest win came in 1994, when he won a tournament to become the NWA World Heavyweight Champion at age 22. Once nicknamed No Gimmicks Needed due to his No Frills brilliance, Candido will be posthumously inducted into the ECW Arena's Hardcore Hall of Fame in 2009. May 1st Raw branded Backlash is an inoffensive, mostly enjoyable card, emanating from the Verizon Wireless Center in Manchester, New Hampshire. On the card, Batista barely holds off Triple H to retain the World Heavyweight title, while Edge defeats Chris Benoit to retain his Money in the Bank briefcase. In the semi-main, a dream team of legends come together, as Hulk Hogan teams with Shawn Michaels to defeat Muhammad Hassan and Davari. May 7th Ring of Honor puts on one of its most consistently great shows to date in Manhattan Mayhem at the Big Apple's New Yorker Hotel. The matches seemingly get better as the show progresses, as Samoa Joe defeats 20-year-old Jay Lethal to win the Pure title, Jimmy Rave outlasts CM Punk in a dog collar match, Austin Aries retains the world title over Alex Shelley, and Joe and Lethal come together for the main event in a loss to Homicide and Low Key. May 9th Chris Kresge, distinguished biographer and veteran television writer who became the head of WWE Creative in 1999, passes away from cancer at age 42. Kresge was credited for the high volume of continuity and character layering that existed in WWE during his year at the helm. Though replaced by Stephanie McMahon as head writer in 2000, Kresge remained with the company into 2002. May 10th you Can't See Me, a 17-song studio album from John Cena and The Trademark, hits retailers. Among the extensive track lists are Cena's theme song, The Time Is Now, as well as the single Bad Bad Man, which is accompanied by a music video spoofing the A-Team. You Can't See Me will debut at number 15 on the Billboard 200 charts. The same day, TNA head booker Dusty Rhodes resigns from his position after being told that he would have to be a part of a booking committee going forward. Rhodes was an on-air authority figure at the time and was officially written out of television as of the following month's Slammiversary pay-per-view. May 11th Luther Reigns, one-time bodyguard to Kurt Angle on the SmackDown brand, requests and receives his release from WWE. Though at one point pushed strongly enough to have a pay-per-view match with The Undertaker, Reigns will only wrestle five more career matches, the last of which occurs in September 2000. May 13th The main event of Pro Wrestling Gorilla's Jason Takes PWG card in Los Angeles sees PWG champion AJ Styles go to a one-hour draw with TNA X Division champion Christopher Daniels in a title-for-title -title match. May 14th 
Hiroyoshi Tenzan becomes IWGP Heavyweight Champion for the fourth time, defeating Tenkozy partner Satoshi Kojima at Nexus 6 in Tokyo. May 15th. At TNA's Hard Justice in Orlando, Jeff Jarrett's 347-day reign as NWA champion comes to an end, as AJ Styles defeats him in a match officiated by UFC star Tito Ortiz. Meanwhile, Jeff Hardy is suspended indefinitely after missing multiple flights and no-showing the pay-per-view. Scheduled opponent Raven instead faces Sean Waltman in Raven's own specialty match, the Clockwork Orange House of Fun. Seriously, someone needs to bring that back, just for the name. May 16th. During a number one contenders tournament final on Monday Night Raw, Lita turns on Kane and aligns with Edge, as WWE opts to fuse real life with storyline to create a contemptible power couple. May 19th. Diamond Dallas Page leaves TNA, reportedly after having issues with the booking of his matches at both Lockdown and Hard Justice. Other outlets have it that Page opted out after the resignation of longtime friend Dusty Rhodes as head booker. May 22nd. Judgment Day is arguably the blue brand's strongest offering since the heyday of the SmackDown 6. A crowd of 12,000 at Minneapolis's Target Center witnesses John Cena retain his WWE title over JBL in a gory I Quit match, in which Cena rivals, if not outdoes, Eddie Guerrero's blood loss from a year earlier. Also on the card, Rey Mysterio defeats former partner turned rival again Guerrero via disqualification and Cruiserweight champion. Paul London defeats Chavo Guerrero. It's a forgotten gem of a B-show, if you can ignore the insipid storyline behind Kurt Angle and Booker T's match. May 27th. TNA Impact airs for the final time on Fox Sports Net due to an expiring contract, though select regional networks will continue to air the show in syndication. For fans in other markets, while TNA searches for a more beneficial deal, episodes of Impact are made available through BitTorrent downloads on the TNA website. Seriously, 2005 was really primitive. YouTube was about a month old at this point, and now it's in all of our eyes all of the time. Never stopping. Always spinning. Forever spinning. May 30th. John Cena gets new music, so the other top champion gets new music too. For the first time, Batista enters to Saliva's I Walk Alone, a new metal cover, more or less, of the ominous sounding theme he'd used since 2002. And what a banger! June 6th. WWE's annual draft commences with a bombshell move. WWE Champion John Cena crossing over from SmackDown to Raw to one of the largest pops he would ever receive. It won't be till the end of the month that World Heavyweight Champion Batista is moved to SmackDown as the logical corresponding move. June 8th. TNA's Shark Boy sues Miramax Films, claiming that the upcoming film The Adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl infringed upon his trademark. The suit will eventually be settled in 2007 for an undisclosed amount. June 10th. Hardcore Homecoming, a reunion venture founded by ECW icon Shane Douglas and TNA announcer Jeremy Borash as a counter to WWE's upcoming show, holds a seven-match card at the ECW Arena in Philadelphia. In the main event, Sabu defeats Douglas and Terry Funk in a barbed wire match, during which Mick Foley makes a mid-match surprise appearance to take over as referee. Other bouts include Raven defeating the Sandman, Jerry Lynn beating Just Incredible, and Two Cold Scorpio defeating Kid Cash. June 11th. On or around this date, CM Punk signs with WWE, one month after working a tryout match with Val Venus. He's expected to finish up with Ring of Honor the following weekend. June 12th. An extreme weekend concludes with ECW One Night Stand, before 2,500 raucous fans at New York's Hammerstein Ballroom. The WWE-produced event is arranged and booked by Paul Heyman and Tommy Dreamer, and proves to be a hearty bowl of chicken soup for the hardcore fan's soul. 
From a bloody, fiery main event spectacle to Mike Awesome and Masato Tanaka's steel chair duel to other impressive action up and down the seven match card, all eras of ECW receive their due. The show concludes with Steve Austin, briefly an ECW performer in 1995, leading a beatdown of various WWE heels that attended the show in opposition. June 16th. Ron Trongard, a longtime AWA broadcaster that briefly worked for WWE in the late 80s, passes away from liver cancer, aged 72. In addition to wrestling, Trongard was the voice for many sports franchises in the Minneapolis-St. Paul region, as well as a local radio personality. June 18th Though most figure the match to be his swan song, CM Punk astonishingly defeats Ring of Honor world champion Austin Aries at Death Before Dishonor 3 in Morristown, New Jersey to win the title. The match provokes a myriad of emotions, but shock and disbelief overwhelm the atmosphere when emotional new champion Punk suddenly turns and spitefully vows to deliver the title to WWE, before hastily exiting the venue in a crazy scene. This title change spawns the first ever Summer of Punk. June 19th. TNA celebrates three years of running shows with Slammiversary in Orlando. In the main event, Raven replaces Jeff Jarrett in a five-way King of the Mountain match and goes on to win the NWA world title after outlasting AJ Styles, Abyss, Monty Brown, and Sean Waltman. Earlier in the night, Samoa Joe makes his TNA debut, defeating Sonjay Dutt in a mostly one-sided six-minute bout. The same day, Tiger Mask Four wins the 2005 Best of the Super Juniors tournament after defeating Gado in the finals. June 20th. An in-show wedding on Monday Night Raw between Edge and Lita goes awry when Kane violently intervenes. Before then, the wedding was disrupted by the entrance video of Matt Hardy, which was quickly revealed to be a cruel hoax on the part of the couple. June 26th. Following a very good judgment day and a crowd-pleasing ECW one-night stand, WWE churns out another classic event in the Raw-branded Vengeance, before slightly under 10,000 fans at Las Vegas' Thomas and Mack Center. The final three matches of the night achieve subjective excellence, as Shawn Michaels gets his win back over Kurt Angle, John Cena retains the WWE title against Chris Jericho and Christian, and Batista holds on to the World Heavyweight title with a bloody Hell in a Cell win over Triple H. July 1st Independent wrestler Matt Stryker resigns from his position as a high school social studies teacher in New York after school officials learned that he'd been using his sick time in order to make wrestling bookings, some of which were with WWE as an enhancement talent. Shortly after the story makes national headlines, Stryker formally signs with WWE, who incorporates his teaching background into his on-screen persona. July 4th After teaming with Hulk Hogan to defeat Kurt Angle and Carl Carlito with a Raw slash SmackDown double taping in Sacramento, Shawn Michaels unexpectedly super kicks Hogan during the post-match celebration, leaving Hogan laying and the crowd in shock. As part of the SmackDown tapings the same night, ECW alumnus The Blue Meanie defeats JBL in a no DQ match, which included a particularly nasty chair shot by Steven Richards on JBL. And a little known fact for all you wrestling fans out there, the match came about after JBL legitimately beat Meanie bloody during the show ending brawl at One Night Stand in June, and Meanie subsequently reveals that he's considering legal action against John Layfield. Somebody should really make a video about that. Something else quite notable happens at these tapings, but that'll be discussed with greater context in a couple of entries' time. July 6th. Close to 20 individuals are released from WWE in one of the biggest waves of cuts ever enacted until the pandemic era anyway. The Dudley Boys, Charlie Haas, Mordecai, Dawn Marie, Jackie Gaida, Marty Jannetty, and Maven are just some of the recognizable performers that get the axe. July 7th. 
On the day that terrorists attacked London public transport systems by detonating four bombs, killing 56 and injuring nearly 800, UPN broadcasts a bad taste WWE storyline made worse by its timing. At Monday's double TV taping, SmackDown heel Mohammed Hassan dispatches several ski masked camouflage wearing individuals to the ring to attack The Undertaker with clubs and piano wire. The segment airs in full in the US and Canada, but is pulled from overseas broadcasts. Broadcasts. UPN, the American broadcast home for SmackDown, will pressure WWE to keep Hassan off its programming as media outlets pick up on the controversial angle. In a lighter note from all the ugliness, in Hassan's forced absence, WWE has 20-year-old Tommaso Ciampa, complete with a full head of hair and no beard, play his lawyer in one TV segment, which results in The Undertaker beating the future NXT champion senseless. July 8th. Jim Cornette is fired from his position as head booker at WWE's developmental group Ohio Valley Wrestling. Cornette had been suspended months earlier for repeatedly striking trainee Anthony Corelli, the future Santino Morella, who had been sitting in the crowd at an OVW taping and reacted with laughter instead of fear at the boogeyman. Though Cornette does return from the suspension, WWE fires him not long after. Days later, Paul Heyman takes over as OVW's new booker. July 10th, Hogan Knows Best premieres on VH1. The reality program documents the totally normal lives of Hulk Hogan, then wife Linda, and children Brooke and Nick. Nasty boy Brian Nobbs essentially plays the wacky neighbor. Somehow, this lasts for four seasons. July 11th, three-time IWGP champion Shinya Hashimoto, one of New Japan's biggest draws and most dominant figures of the 1990s, passes away from a brain aneurysm one week after his 40th birthday. Known as King of Destruction, Hashimoto was also a former NWA world champion, held All Japan's Triple Crown, won the 1998 G1 Climax, and was named Wrestler of the Year by Tokyo Sports in 1994. After leaving New Japan in 2000, Hashimoto co-founded Pro Wrestling Zero One with Shinjiro Otani, though he left the organization in 2004. Hashimoto's son Daichi carries on the family name in wrestling, competing in Big Japan Wrestling as of 2022. That same night, just before his WWE non-compete period lapses, Matt Hardy returns to the company, attacking Edge in a wild scene on Raw that somehow blurs the lines between fiction and reality. July 16th. Miguel Perez Sr., one half of a popular tag team in the 1950s with Antonino Rocca, passes away from a massive heart attack at the age of 68. With Rocker, Perez held the Northeast versions of the NWA World and US Tag Team titles while competing in the Capital Wrestling Corporation, the precursor to WWE. Perez also held the WWC Puerto Rico Championship four times in the 1970s. July 17th. With their search for a new national TV outlet nearing its end, TNA holds a very enjoyable no surrender in Orlando. AJ Styles defeats Sean Waltman in a high-quality junior heavyweight clash of eras, Samoa Joe chokes out Chris Sabin in an excellent encounter, and Raven retains the NWA world title against Abyss in a dog collar match. After the bout, as former champion Jeff Jarrett confronts the current title holder, Rhino suddenly makes his TNA debut, goring Raven to close the show. July 18th. Kazuyuki Fujita becomes IWGP heavyweight champion for the third time, defeating Hiroyoshi Tenzan in Sapporo. The same day, the Hebner twins, referee Earl and executive Dave, are fired from WWE for allegedly selling company merchandise without authorization. The sales are reportedly made at a St. Louis-based store that Earl is part owner of. Both Hebners had been with WWE dating back to the 1980s. July 21st. TNA's TV woes come to an end after gaining a 
Saturday night time slot with Spike TV, the soon-to-be former home of WWE programming. Impact will hit Spike's airwaves on Saturday night, October 1st, five days after the final Spike broadcast of Monday Night Raw. The same day, Lord Alfred Hayes, longtime wrestler and manager best known for his broadcasting role in WWE during the 80s and 90s, passes away after a series of strokes at the age of 76. As a wrestler, Hayes, a legitimate black belt in judo, held the NWA Western States heavyweight title on five occasions and gained a measure of fame for his feud with Bobby Heenan in the AWA. In WWE, however, Hayes's eloquent diction and passing demeanor cast him as a comedic sidekick for the better part of his decade with the company. July 24th. The streak of top-shelf WWE pay-per-views ends with a thud, as Great American Bash infests Buffalo's HSBC Arena with 8,000 fans in attendance. In the fallout from the Muhammad Hassan storyline, Hassan loses a number one contenders match to The Undertaker that he was originally supposed to win. And after Undertaker obliterates him in the post-match sequence, Hassan becomes persona non grata in WWE. The rest of the show resides in the range of mediocre to just plain bad, as Animal and Heidenreich become tag team champions with a bastardized LOD tribute act, while Batista and JBL trudge to a DQ finish in the main event world title match. August 2nd. After briefly negotiating terms of a possible return to the company, Brock Lesnar ultimately backs out of a WWE comeback. The two sides had been tied up in legal matters after Lesnar challenged the validity of the non-compete agreement that he'd signed to leave WWE in the spring of 2004. August 3rd. In the ultimate hell freezes over moment, Bret Hart meets with Vince McMahon at WWE headquarters, and the two pose for a widely disseminated photo together. The hitman begins taking part in a DVD anthology focusing on his storied career. August 9th. Ken Anderson debuts at WWE's Velocity Tapings, defeating Funaki. Before the match, Anderson provides intentionally obnoxious ring introductions, which will become his trademark. Weeks later, Anderson takes on the surname Kennedy at the behest of Vince, and Mr. Kennedy is duly unleashed upon the WWE landscape. August 12th. CM Punk drops the Ring of Honor world title in a four-way dance in Dayton, Ohio to James Gibson, the former Jamie Noble. Actually, he's soon to become Jamie Noble once more, as Gibson re-signs with WWE at the end of July to help beef up the stagnant cruiserweight division. August 13th. CM Punk departs from Ring of Honor after losing to then-friend Colt Cabana in a two-out-of-three falls match in the main event of Punk The Final Chapter, before 1,200 fans in Chicago. The card ends with a tearful farewell to Punk, who, true to character, toasts everybody with a Pepsi. August 14th. TNA keeps the train rolling toward its Spike TV debut with Sacrifice in Orlando. The best bout of the night sees Samoa Joe defeat AJ Styles in the finals of the Super X Cup tournament. In the main event, Jeff Jarrett and Rhino defeat Raven and Sabu in a decidedly hardcore brawl. Rhino pins the NWA world champion himself, much to the chagrin of Jarrett, who would have earned a title bout himself if he had pinned Raven. On the same night, Masahiro Chono defeats Kazuyuki Fujita to win the G1 Climax for a record-extending fifth time, solidifying his nicknames of Mr. G1 and Mr. August. August 15th. Who's your daddy, Montreal? A heel turned Shawn Michaels masterfully trolls Montreal during an episode of Raw, playing with the crowd's general distaste toward him and even faking them out by having Bret Hart's entrance music play. It's arguably Michaels' finest professional moment that doesn't involve him actually doing any wrestling. On the same date, Ashley Massaro wins the 2005 WWE Diva Search. Fourth place finisher Crystal Marshall is eventually hired by WWE as well. August 18th. Chris Cash, a former CZW tag team champion, passes away at the age of 23 as a result of injuries sustained in a motorcycle accident. CZW will pay tribute to Cash with an annual event entitled Down With The Sickness, named for the disturbed song that was Cash's entrance theme. The event generally centers around a ladder match, a specialty of Cash's. 
August 21st. One of the most unusual summer slams ever plays out before 18,000 fans at Washington DC's MCI Center. And it turns out to be the second most bought summer slam of all time, behind only 1998. The main event sees Hulk Hogan defeat Shawn Michaels in a match notorious for Michaels taking over-exaggerated bumps off of Hulk's strikes. Hogan reportedly refused to lay down for Michaels in this match or any future match they had, so HBK clowns the Hulkster en route to the finish. Elsewhere on the card, Edge defeats Matt Hardy via stoppage in a match with some clearly unpulled punches, while Chris Benoit beats Orlando Jordan in 25 seconds to win the US title. And Rey Mysterio wins a somewhat muddled ladder match over Eddie Guerrero to retain legal custody of his son Dominic. Or is WWE? WWE calls it Sunday. August 22nd. One day after failing to beat John Cena for the WWE title at SummerSlam, Chris Jericho loses to Cena once more on Raw, having wagered his employment in the process. Indeed, Jericho genuinely leaves WWE after the match, citing burnout and a yearning to take on other projects. Y2J won't return for over two years. August 27th. Another Wrestle Reunion card is held. This one before 900 fans in Philadelphia. The main event sees the newly christened Team 3D defeat Rhino and Matt Hardy. The bout is 3D's first match since leaving WWE, while it's Hardy's last indie obligation before returning to WWE full-time. The same day, Nigel McGuinness wins the Ring of Honor Pure title from Samoa Joe in Buffalo. McGuinness will go on to reign with the belt for 350 days. August 29th WWE Day of Reckoning 2 is released for Nintendo GameCube. Improved graphics and a strategy-based submission system make for a much more realistic wrestling experience. In fact, probably the only unrealistic aspect of the game is Stacey Keebler wanting to be your created character's girlfriend in story mode, you big loser. September 1st. Deep South Wrestling holds its first card in front of 160 fans in McDonough, Georgia. The six-match card features Mike Mizanin, the future Miz, Deacon DeVille, the future Doc Gallows, and Ryan Reeves, the future Skip Sheffield. September 9th. WWE SmackDown debuts in its new Friday night time slot on UPN. The initial broadcast is somewhat halved by a multi-network benefit concert being held for victims of Hurricane Katrina, so the first hour of SmackDown is exclusive to WWE.com, while the second hour airs on UPN. That second hour includes Eddie Guerrero defeating Rey Mysterio in a steel cage match, while World Heavyweight Champion Batista beats JBL in a bull rope match. September 11th. On the whole, TNA Unbreakable in Orlando is one of the company's more inconsistent efforts, but the main event more than makes up for an average undercard. The final bout sees AJ Styles win the X Division title in a triple threat over Christopher Daniels and Samoa Joe in what many lord as the greatest match in TNA history. Elsewhere on the card, Abyss beats Sabu in a no-DQ match, Austin Aries defeats Generation Next teammate Roderick Strong, and Ray Raven retains the NWA world title over Rhino in a Ravens rules match. September 12th. Nine months after winning the contest, Million Dollar Tough Enough winner Daniel Puder is released from WWE. Reports indicate that success quickly went to Puder's head, and he gets duly humbled during the 2005 Royal Rumble match by Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, and Bob Holly. Puder disappears from the main roster after the Rumble and spends the summer months in OVW before getting cut. September 15th. Jeff Jarrett regains the NWA world title from Raven at a Border City wrestling card in Windsor, Ontario, promoted by heel TNA manager Scott Damore that's heavy on TNA performers. Late in the match, Chris Harris and James Storm of America's Most Wanted align with Jarrett by turning heel and costing Raven his title. September 17th. Brian Danielson defeats James Gibson to win the Ring of Honor world title after a 32-minute battle at Glory by Honor 4 on Long Island. September 18th. Ric Flair competes the unlikeliest triple crown in WWE history when the 56-year-old defeats Carlito to win the Intercontinental title at Unforgiven before 8,000 fans at the Ford Center in Oklahoma City. 
perhaps more unlikely, Flair actually hit a top rope move during the match. Also on the card, Matt Hardy defeats Edge in a steel cage match, a face once more Shawn Michaels beats Chris Masters, and Kurt Angle defeats WWE Champion John Cena by DQ. September 21st Two months after last appearing for WWE, Muhammad Hassan is released. The 23-year-old quickly went from being penciled in for a World Heavyweight title reign to leaving the business altogether. Outside of three indie matches in 2018, the real-life Mark Capani has focused much of his post-WWE life on education, becoming a history teacher and later a junior high school principal. September 27th WWE releases the controversial self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior DVD. The documentary comes to be viewed as a one-sided hit piece, as various personalities of WWE's past rail on Warrior for reasons that range from fair to petty. The former Jim Helwig himself does not participate in the production. October 1st TNA Impact premieres on Spike as a one-hour program. Team 3D make their TNA debuts on the broadcast as part of a wild brawl involving Jeff Jarrett, Kevin Nash, and several tag teams and factions. The episode was taped with the two other shows four nights earlier, and Team 3D weren't the only ex-WWE stars that debuted. Gail Kim will arrive on the second Spike episode, aligning with Jarrett and America's Most Wanted. The same night, Kenta Kobashi defeats Samoa Joe in a critically acclaimed war at a Ring of Honor event in New York City. The match contains a memorable sequence in which Kobashi chops Joe in machine gun-like fashion, delivering around 100 total strikes and greatly discoloring Joe's skin in the process. October 3rd Monday Night Raw returns to the USA Network after a five-year absence, hosting a special three-hour homecoming broadcast before 14,000 fans in Dallas. A number of legendary figures appear through the night to go along with some pay-per-view caliber matches. Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle go to a draw in a 30-minute Iron Man match, Edge defeats Matt Hardy in a ladder match to banish his rival from Raw, and Triple H makes his return after a three-month sabbatical, turning on Ric Flair after a tag team bout. Oh, and Steve Austin beats up all the McMahons, giving Linda the worst stunner a McMahon would ever take until 2022 anyway. Though Raw returns to USA, it's the only existing WWE program that makes the move back from Spike. Secondary shows Heat and Velocity become internet exclusives, though USA Network will broadcast a condensed version of Raw titled AM Raw on Saturday mornings. October 8th. Amid legal issues between Brock Lesnar and WWE over the terms of the non-compete agreement he signed upon leaving the company in 2004, the heavyweight star debuts for New Japan. In his first match with the company, Lesnar defeats Kazuyuki Fujita and Masahiro Chono at the Tokyo Dome to win the IWGP heavyweight title. Lesnar pins Chono with the F5, which he's renamed The Verdict for use outside of WWE. October 9th A somewhat lukewarm No Mercy draws 7,000 to Houston's Toyota Center. Those 7,000 fans get to witness Randy Orton and Father Cowboy Bob incinerate The Undertaker inside a casket, which is weirdly not the first time a father and son have immolated the dead man inside a large coffin. In the main event, Batista retains the World Heavyweight title against Eddie Guerrero, as part of an angle where Eddie tries to befriend Batista, whose guard is understandably up due to Guerrero's penchant for unfair play. Late in the match, Guerrero does fight off the urge to use a chair on Batista before coming up short against the champ. October 10th you want to get some aspirin ready for this one? Due to Steve Austin beating up his entire family last week on Raw, Vince McMahon demands the entire commentary team apologize for not intervening. Hang on, it gets dumber. Jerry Lawler and Jonathan Coachman apologize, but JR is a little more indignant. So Stephanie smacks him. Linda comes out for the theatrical save, but instead fires JR and kicks him in the balls. This mystifying bit of TV was done to write out Jim Ross, who needs time off to undergo colon surgery. And speaking of mystifying TV, a week later, Vince McMahon stars in a skit where he and a nurse pull things out of Jim Ross's ass. You heard me correctly. Shockingly and reportedly, 
Only one person found this funny. Guess who? But the October 10th Raw isn't all terrible. Earlier in the night, WWE's women's division received a major upgrade with the debut of Mickey James, who saves champion Trish Stratus from an attack by Victoria. James is soon after revealed to be an obsessed fan of Stratus, a role that she will play with absolute gusto. October 22nd. Reggie the Crusher Lasowski, three-time world champion and one of the biggest all-time draws in the AWA, passes away from a brain tumor at the age of 79. A working-class, beer-guzzling brute that was as tough as his nickname indicated, the Crusher galvanized blue-collar fans of the region, particularly in his native South Milwaukee. In addition to the three world titles, the Crusher also reigned at least 12 times as some form of tag team champion with fellow no-nonsense roughneck Dick the Bruiser. In 2019, a bronze statue of the Crusher was unveiled in South Milwaukee. October 23rd. TNA Bound for Glory in Orlando, theoretically the company's answer to WrestleMania, is greatly compromised by world title challenger Kevin Nash being hospitalized with a medical emergency. An underwhelming battle royal is held to determine a new number one contender, which is won by Rhino. He then defeats Jeff Jarrett in a very short match to capture the NWA world title. Add in an Ultimate X match that concludes with the X falling off prematurely, and TNA has certainly seen better nights. But Bound for Glory isn't a total loss. Samoa Joe vs Jushin Thunder Liger, a harrowing Monsters Ball four-way match, and yet another AJ Styles Christopher Daniels 30-minute Iron Man match balance misfortune with some dependable goodness. October 25th. Two days after enacting the quickie title change to make up for Kevin Nash's absence, TNA has Jeff Jarrett regain the NWA world title from Rhino at the Orlando Impact tapings. The title change airs on November 3rd as part of a Thursday night primetime special. October 28th. Steve Austin reportedly balks at plans to lose to Jonathan Coachman at the forthcoming Taboo Tuesday pay-per-view. Hang on. I'll give you a moment to register that sentence. Austin is supposed to face Coach in a match where Jim Ross would be reinstated if he wins. Once he learns he's losing, probably through the employment of the finest chicanery, Austin backs out, citing a sudden injury. The same day, some time after departing from TNA due to disputes over company direction, Jerry Jarrett arrives at WWE headquarters and introduces company officials to imposing prospect Oleg Prudius, the future Vladimir Kozlov. Photos of Jarrett and Prudius are splattered all over the company website, presumably for no other reason than to show fans that TNA's champion's father prefers to hang out with the big boys. October 31st. Christian's contract with WWE expires, and he opts not to re-sign. Despite being a free agent, Christian still appears at the following night's Taboo Tuesday in a backstage segment, to fulfill part of an angle. November 1st. The second annual Taboo Tuesday takes place in front of 6,000 fans at San Diego's I Pay One Center. The undercard is mostly light-hearted filler voted for by the fans, with SmackDown's Batista suddenly filling in for Steve Austin against Coach. The JR reinstatement angle is dropped as Batista just mauls Coach in mere minutes, while fending off interference from, of all people, Gold Dust and a very labored Vader. The final two bouts save the show, as Ric Flair defeats Triple H in a bloody steel cage match, while John Cena retains his WWE title over Kurt Angle and Shawn Michaels in a triple threat bout. The event also features Joey Styles on commentary, as he takes over as lead Raw voice in Jim Ross's absence. November 5th. 
The final hardcore homecoming event, titled November Rain, is held in front of 700 fans at the ECW Arena. Team 3D returns to their old Philly stomping grounds to defeat Sabu and Terry Funk, while Just Incredible defeats Jerry Lynn in a steel cage match, with an assist from former Impact player's partner Lance Storm. On the same date, Akira Taue wins the GHC heavyweight title from Takeshi Rikio in Tokyo. November 9th. Less than two months after reporting to Ohio Valley Wrestling, CM Punk wins the developmental group's television title, defeating future spirit squatter Ken Doan in Louisville. November 13th. Former WWE champion Eddie Guerrero passes away suddenly from heart failure at a hotel in Minneapolis. He was just 38 years old. Guerrero was planned to wrestle that night at a dual Raw and SmackDown taping. In his 19 years in the business, Guerrero held championships in WWE, WCW, ECW, AAA, and won New Japan's Best of the Super Juniors in 1996. Across his final years, Guerrero's story of conquering personal demons inspired many, as he eventually defied all odds to become WWE Champion in 2004. The Raw and SmackDown tapings that night become an extended tribute to Guerrero. Raw ends with John Cena placing the WWE Championship onto an Eddie Guerrero t-shirt, while SmackDown concludes with Guerrero's best friends Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko sharing the ring. The same night, TNA holds its Genesis pay-per-view in Orlando, with several promotional figures also paying tribute to Guerrero. The main event sees Team 3D and Rhino defeat Jeff Jarrett and America's Most Wanted. Earlier in the night, Christian Cage makes his TNA debut and takes a few light shots at his former employer. At night's end, Christian turns down an offer to join Team Canada, instead aligning with the company's babyfaces. November 15th. The best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be, a three-disc DVD set commemorating the career of Bret Hart is released. Included are 18 full-length matches and a positive documentary on the storied career of the Hitman. This is in stark contrast to the original plans for the DVD, which would have been a hatchet job burial of Hart and his career, similar to the Warrior set, before Hart suddenly made amends with his former employer. The same day, WWE also releases SmackDown vs Raw 2006 for PlayStation 2. Lauded are the inclusion of General Manager Mode, a Create an Entrance feature, and the debut of the Buried Alive match. November 17th. While on WWE's European tour, Nick Eugene Dinsmore is rushed to a local hospital after passing out in a hotel lobby in Manchester, England. This coming just four days after Guerrero's death, WWE quickly reports on their own website that Dinsmore admitted to taking somas and other prescription meds. As a result, WWE sends Dinsmore home and suspends him indefinitely. November 21st. At the Raw tapings in Sheffield, England, WWE informs its roster that it will enact a drug testing policy. The wellness policy eventually goes into effect in February of 2006. November 23rd. Ric Flair is alleged to have attacked a fellow motorist on Interstate 495 in Charlotte during an apparent road rage incident. Flair posts bail after being formally arrested the following week. WWE goes so far as to have on-screen rival Edge recreate the incident in a farcical pre-tape, dressing as Flair and beating up a motorist played by future NXT performer Robert Stone. November 27th. For the first time ever, Survivor Series becomes the only night of the year where Raw and SmackDown stars go head-to-head -head in direct competition. If you ignore the Royal Rumble and all of those other pesky events, that is. Nonetheless, the 2005 Survivor Series draws 15,000 fans to Detroit's Joe Louis Arena for a pretty excellent card all round. Highlights include Triple H's last man standing win over Ric Flair and Chris Benoit and Booker T's first match of a best of seven to determine a new US champion. The lowlights are Theodore Long's match with Eric Bischoff and Vince McMahon's very racist choice of words in a backstage conversation with John Cena. 
In the main event, SmackDown beats Raw in a frenetic 5-on-5 elimination bout made more contentious by the broadcast team sniping at each other in feisty fashion. Randy Orton is the sole survivor, but his celebration is cut short when The Undertaker dramatically returns from beyond the grave or a long fishing trip, whichever one it was. November 29th as part of a special live one-hour SmackDown from Cincinnati, Randy Orton knocks Undertaker unconscious, throws him into the back of Eddie Guerrero's lowrider, which Rey Mysterio rode to the ring in tribute for the preceding match, and drives in reverse through the entranceway, causing a huge explosion. Bad as that may sound, fear not. WWE will be sure to incorporate the late Eddie Guerrero into many more storyline moments come 2006. December third. Close to 1,000 fans in New York experience Ring of Honor Steel Cage Warfare. In the titular match, Generation Next members Austin Aries, Jack Evans, Matt Seidel, and Roderick Strong defeat the Embassy's Abyss, Jimmy Rave, Alex Shelley, and Prince Nana after nearly 42 minutes of chaos. December 5th. After three and a half years as Raw GM, Eric Bischoff is written out of the show following a comedic trial where Vince McMahon himself serves as judge. McMahon takes over as de facto authority figure for the months ahead. The same day, barely one year after winning the first ever WWE Diva Search, Christy Hemi is released from the company. The prior week, Hemi had debuted in OVW to pick up more seasoning. December 9th. Lex Luger, Scott Steiner, and Buff Bagwell are removed from a flight to Winnipeg for unclear reasons. Though Steiner and Bagwell are eventually freed to continue their trip, Luger is charged with violating probation for failing to obtain permission to leave the country. He's later sentenced to four months in jail. December 11th. TNA caps off a whirlwind 2005 with its turning point pay-per-view in Orlando. Christian Cage wrestles his first pay-per-view bout for TNA, defeating Monty Brown, while Samoa Joe wins the X Division title from AJ Styles in a true match of the year candidate. After Jeff Jarrett retains the NWA world title over Rhino in the main event, the trench coats, boots, and baseball bat of Sting magically appear in the ring, foreshadowing the impending return of the icon. December 12th. Tajiri parts ways with WWE after losing to Gregory Helms at a Sunday night heat taping. Tajiri had stated a desire to return home to Japan and pursue a career in journalism. December 17th. Ring of Honor holds final battle in Edison, New Jersey. On the card, pure champion Nigel McGuinness defeats Claudio Castagnoli. Brian Danielson retains the world title over Naomichi Marafuji, and GHC Junior Heavyweight Champion Kenta defeats Loki. Key. December 18th. WWE Armageddon is held in front of 8,000 fans at the Dunkin' Donuts Center in Providence, and it's quite a newsworthy show. In the main event, The Undertaker ends his long feud with Randy Orton, defeating him in a Hell in a Cell match. The match is somewhat controversial, however, as an interfering cowboy Bob Orton bleeds profusely at the hands of Undertaker. It later comes out that the Elder Orton has Hepatitis C, something that Undertaker did not know about, but talent relations head John Laurinaitis did. And Laurinaitis is reportedly the one who gave Orton the go-ahead to Blade during the match. The whole fiasco ends with Cowboy Bob being released from WWE in early 2006. Also during the show, retired referee Tim White apparently turned a gun on himself. Not really, due to being depressed about Hell in a Cell ruining his career. Oh well, can't grieve forever, here comes Juventud Guerrera, let's get back to the ring! December 27th. After missing close to two years due to several injuries, Mark Henry returns to WWE at the SmackDown tapings, helping Eminem retain their tag team titles from Batista and Rey Mysterio. And to paraphrase the world's strongest man, well, I think we've had enough of 2005. It's time for the year to end.